Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by the Ernst and Gertrude Tico Charitable Foundation. Welcome. I'm Amanda Williams with the MacArthur Memorial, and I'm here today with Dr. Elizabeth Atwood, author of The Liberation of Marguerite Harrison, America's First Female Foreign Intelligence Agent. Thank you very much, Dr. Atwood, for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what drew you to this topic? Well, thank you again for having me. I'm delighted to be here with you. I was a uh, journalist for the Baltimore Sun. I worked there for many years. I joined in 1988 as a news reporter, and then I later became an editor at the newspaper. And when I joined the newspaper, I guess part of the folklore of the institution was the story of Marguerite Harrison. We all knew that she had been a female reporter and that she had actually worked as a spy and a double agent. And her photograph was actually outside one of our conference rooms. So she, I just had this awareness that uh, this woman was uh, had been a reporter at the paper and was a, had a fascinating history. So I left the newspaper in 2010 to become a journalism professor at Hood College. And uh, when I had the opportunity to take a sabbatical, I decided I wanted to write an interesting story that hadn't been told yet or had not been fully told yet. And so that's where my thought went back to Marguerite Harrison. Some historians had written about her in chapters of books, and there have been some articles written about her. She had actually had published her memoirs in the 1930s, but I felt like there was more to say about her. And that was why I set about researching this topic and, and getting to know Marguerite Harrison in that way. Now, she's a really fascinating, very complicated person. Can you walk us through her early life and how it might have prepared her to be an intelligence agent? Harrison was a very complicated woman. She was neither a hero nor a villain. She was a bit of a mixture of the both. She was born in 1878 as the older daughter of a prominent Baltimore family. Her father, Bernard Nadal Baker, was a shipping magnate and one of the most wealthy men in Baltimore. But it was really her mother who shaped her. Elizabeth Livesey Baker was very ambitious, and she was grooming Marguerite to be the wife of uh, an aristocrat, and she had in her mind preferably European royalty. And uh, this wasn't as unusual as you might think, because there had been a lot of American women born into wealthy families in this country in the Gilded Age who had married into European royalty. We think, of course, of uh, Jenny Jerome, who was uh, the mother of, of Winston Churchill, as one prominent example. So with uh, her mother's prompting and urging, uh, she started to groom Marguerite to be this, um, to have this background, to be the wife of an aristocrat. And the family, they employed a governess. And every summer they would go to Europe and there they hobnob with British royalty and the titans of the industry. Uh, her father donated a hospital ship to Great Britain during the Boer War and that endeared him to the British society. So the family, uh, they, they were really making inroads into the British aristocracy, but they also would travel to the continent. And in that time, Marguerite really became fluent in French and German and Italian. She had a natural gift for languages, and she often, is, even as a child, acted as the family's translator. Uh, and of course, she also became very familiar with the history and the culture of these countries. Now, in the end, she ended up disappointing her mother because she chose to marry a Baltimore banker instead of a European aristocrat. But that foundation to know, learn the languages and learn the culture of Europe really prepared her to be a spy during World War I. So how does she become involved with U.S. intelligence? She started out as a very typical uh, Baltimore aristocrat, marrying a, a Baltimore banker and settling down. She was 22 years old. And within the first year of her marriage, she had her son. And the beginning of their marriage was very typical for a woman of her life and stature. Uh, they would attend balls that were in Baltimore. She would host uh, parties and at her estate in Catonsville. Um, she devoted her time to a lot of philanthropic causes. And the most important of those was she helped found a children's hospital school. It really evolved into one of the most prominent children's hospitals in Baltimore. At this time in her early marriage, she took only a very passing interest in any kind of events outside of her home. You know, when World War I uh, broke out in Europe, she was really not interested in it. She 
She actually had a lot of family problems at this time. Her father had lost his shipping business and some missteps he had taken. The stock market closed in the summer of 1914, and that put a hardship on her husband, who had become a stockbroker. And then around the same time, her husband started to uh, show some signs of illness. He was having headaches. He was becoming very lethargic. And in the summer of 1915, he actually died of a brain tumor. And so Marguerite was left at a a loss as to what she should do. Uh, She had a 13-year-old son, and she could have certainly gone back to her home in Catonsville, Maryland, and lived with her father. I'm sure he would have welcomed her. But she was a bit of a headstrong woman, and she decided that instead of going back to her father, she actually would stay in town in Baltimore and support herself. She uh, tried to lend lend rooms out to, uh, you know, to on a boarding house. But really, she set upon uh, another occupation that interested her, and that was she wanted to become a newspaper reporter. And this wasn't unheard of. I mean, well-to-do women had often turned to writing when their circumstances had forced them to earn a living. And so it was with her. She went to the Baltimore Sun, where she uh, knew the owner, and he had put in a word for her and recommended that the editor hire her. And she was, in fact, hired to be the society editor of the newspaper. Um, that lasted for um, a little while, but then the United States entered World War One, and she started to become more and more interested in world events, and she became uh, much more interested in what was happening around her outside her home. Her father-in-law, who was uh, Joseph Ames, he worked on some war boards in Washington, D.C. I think that influenced her. Uh, and just kind of the war fever was kind of consuming the whole community. And she herself started to get caught up in this. And she, uh, the, the Baltimore Sun gave her articles to write that were propaganda pieces that would get support for the war. And some of those included getting into the communities and reporting on the immigrant communities. And among those story, stories that she wrote were uh, stories about the German immigrants. And it was at that time she actually started to pass along tips to the Justice Department that might have uh, been about suspected German agents in Baltimore. That went on for another few months, and the war is actually starting to wind down in the summer of 1918 when she really gets into her mind that she wants to do more. And so in the summer of 1918, she applies to the Office of Naval Intelligence to be a foreign agent. The Office of Naval Intelligence told her they didn't accept women. So her father-in-law put her in touch with Marlboro Churchill, who was the head of the new military intelligence division. And Churchill agreed to hire her as a foreign agent and send her to Europe. But uh, before she actually could leave, the armistice was reached in November. And so she thought her spy career was short-lived and would not get off the ground. But actually, Churchill decided that he would send her to Europe anyway. He wanted her to help gather intelligence that would aid the peace negotiations. And so she did. She left in December of 1918, and that was how her espionage, foreign espionage career began. Now, by this time, European women are already involved in their respective intelligence services. Why was the U.S. a little late to this? Well, American women had been spies going back to the American Revolution. Um, There had been women who was spied for George Washington. There were women on both sides of the Civil War who spied both for the North and for the South. But the military historians that I have read said that the reason the United States didn't use women in foreign service was primarily to two reasons. One was they just felt that it was dirty work that was not suited for women. And the second reason, they just didn't trust women to do the job. They didn't think that women could understand military maneuvers and and give accurate reports on military maneuvers. And they also feared that women might fall in love with their targets. And so they just basically didn't trust the women to do the work. That's interesting, the idea of falling in love with your target, being specific to women. Yes. So tell us a little bit about her work during the period of the Versailles Conference. She's been sent overseas as this official agent of the United States. What is she doing? She did, uh, as I say, leave for France in December 1918. Her cover was to be a a representative of the Baltimore Sun. Uh, The Baltimore Sun editors knew about her plan and agreed to send her to write stories uh, over there. And they also had her show a film that the Baltimore Sun had produced that could show to the Maryland troops that um, was pictures of their loved ones waving and holding up signs and so on. So that was her guys. That was the uh, that was her cover as she went into Europe. 
Now, there are some contradictions about exactly what her mission is. She writes in her memoirs that she went around showing the, the film to the troops in France. And then shortly after Christmas, she went into Berlin. And she says that her job was to get a sense of how um, how people were living in Berlin, what was the sentiment like for uh, toward Americans, towards the peace negotiations. And uh, that was mainly her job was just to gather intelligence on what the conditions like in uh, in Berlin. And then later on, uh, she went into other parts of Germany and farther farther east into present day Poland. And uh, so when she arrived there, it was a bit of a turmoil in Berlin. There were communist backed Spartacists that were fighting the remnants of the government troops. Monarchists were still trying to uh, fight to, to try to re- revive the monarchy. And so she infiltrated these various communities. Uh, she, at that time, you know, as she was there, she saw some horrific street battles and she gave reports on those. She gave reports on what the um, people were saying about the peace negotiations. She talked about the food rations. She talked about the um, factory, in, uh, you know, outputs. You know, she would keep up with the newspapers and, of course, talking with the people that um, that she became friends with. She often used her uh, contacts that she, that she had made in America, among the Society of America, to a surprising number of those were actually living in Germany. And they helped her stay in touch with, you know, what was the feeling, especially of the monarchists. Um, and so that was that seemed to be the bulk of what she did. Um, the reason I said that there was some discrepancy is that later on, um, Colonel Ralph Van Diemen reported, told the FBI when they were investigating Marguerite, that her job was to keep her her eye on American journalists who were there to report on the peace negotiations. And then later, they sent her into Germany to try to capture a journalist there, Robert Miner, who was a cartoonist, um, communist journalist and a cartoonist who was distributing propaganda to the American troops. And they sent her there to try to capture him. So, as I said, there's a there is a little bit of a difference of opinion about what her main mission was. But the few reports that I have seen of her existing reports seem to support the idea that she was there to get a general sense of the community and kind of what was what was going on on the ground inside uh, Berlin and other countries to the to the east. So she's going to come out of this period in Germany with a sense that the the peace following World War One is very, very problematic. Mm-hmm. Now her next assignments then take her to Russia twice. Can you give us a, an overview of those missions? Yes, uh, Harrison was very disappointed uh, with that Wilson had not achieved his 14 points for the just peace and that the Europeans had actually succeeded in impressing severe retribution payments from Germany. Uh, she nevertheless came back to Baltimore, uh, resumed her work at the Baltimore Sun very briefly, but she was eager for her next assignment. And I thought one of the most interesting um, aspects of this period that I uncovered was the letters of the men in the military intelligence division who were debating among themselves where she should go next. This proved to me that she really was very well respected as a spy, that the men really thought she had done good work and they had different ideas of where they wanted to send her. Some thought she should go to to Mexico, some thought she should go to Japan, but ultimately Churchill decided to send her to Russia. And this is where you see there is a a, dif- a discrepancy in the way she writes about her work and what I found in the archives. She talks about that, she, you know, that she never imagined that this was a dangerous assignment, that, you know, she just had been interested in Russia all her life and was thrilled to get the chance to go in and see it. But actually, this is absolutely not true. I mean, everybody involved in espionage at this time and intelligence divisions knew that Russia was a very dangerous assignment. At the time they sent her, there were, you know, a dozen Americans already in prison and many others were not allowed to leave the country. Uh, one spy had been caught and was under the death sentence there. And the vice consul of Petrograd, he had run a spy ring and he had been forced to flee to Finland. So the, the intelligence services, Marlborough Churchill uh, especially, knew how dangerous this mission was. And it was unlike the German assignment because she couldn't speak the language. So she had to persuade the, German, the Russians to allow her into the country 
under the pretext that she was a journalist. And again, the Baltimore Sun back the story, sent her with credentials. And these, she also received credentials from the Associated Press in London. But this, pro, this had posed its own risk because Bolshevik Russia was not allowing Western reporters into the country at this time. So the only way she could do it, the country was to illegally cross the border. And she did so, um, uh, at, at the, the, she crossed the Polish border into Russia. And she was betting that the Russian troops wouldn't shoot her on the spot. That they would just pass her along until she got to Moscow. And that's exactly what happened. They did, they didn't kill her right away. They sent her on to Moscow to find out what to be done with this uh, American woman. So she actually enters Russia in February 1920. And um, she's surprised that the Russians gave her permission to stay for a couple of weeks. But what she didn't know at that time was the Russians already knew she was a spy. Because they had uh, they had intercepted a document that she had filed about a suspected communist in, uh, whom she had been on the, the ship with going over to Europe. And she had filed that report in Switzerland and the Bolsheviks had, had received a copy of the report. And so they knew that this woman who was posing as an Associated Press uh, reporter was actually a spy. So they played her along months. They allowed her to see documents that most Westerners and uh, reporters and even domestic reporters were not allowed to see. And then in early April, they arrested her and brought her to the offices of Tekka in Lubyanka prison and presented her with the evidence that they knew she was a spy. And she, she writes incredulously, honestly, that she says, oh, I just thought they would expel me from the country. But she had to know better than that. Um, they had true evidence against her and had allowed her to see documents that were very dangerous for the her to reveal if she had uh, gotten out. So what they did was they pressed upon her um, to become a, for a double agent. So from April until October of 1920, she worked as a double agent, giving Chekhov reports on the foreigners who were living in Moscow, primarily socialists. But she also gave reports on some American uh, intelligence officers as well. Eventually, though, the Chekhov was became dissatisfied with her work, and they arrested her in October. And she, they put her in Lubyanka prison, and she stayed there until the summer of 1921, where she became ill, uh, and then they sent her to a prison hospital, where she stayed a few more weeks until the Americans were able to rescue her. So that was her very first trip into Russia. She comes back into uh, the United States, and no one is quite sure what to make of her. Some intelligence uh, uh, officials think that she has been compromised and she is, in fact, is a Russian spy. But yet Churchill seems to have faith in her and he meets with her again, as well as puts her in touch with Robert Eichelberger and has her. Uh, the next thing we know is a few months after she's returned, she's off on another mission that sends her into Asia. And she goes throughout uh, Japan, Korea, uh, China and uh, Mongolia, and then she ends up in the Far East Republic. And the, in the Far Eastern Republic, she again is caught by the Soviet Russian, Soviet, um, Soviet, yeah, Soviet Russians, the Cheka. And at this point, she again is sent to Moscow and uh, where her father-in-law this time is able to uh, get her, to rescue her, pressing upon the uh, U.S. aid agencies t- that were helping Russia, feeding Russia with grain pressing them to help get her out a second time. So yes, two trips to Russia, and in the sense of a little bit murky of what was she actually trying to accomplish. She seems to have absolutely no fear. Yes, at times it does seem like that. And yet I think she, um, part of it is, I think, some naivete on her part. But I think also some of it is... um, I don't know. I think part of it, we see that confidence in her that, that came from the way she was raised. You know, her governess told her it's more important to be charming than smart. And she often used that charm to um, to to you to her in her intelligence work. And I don't think that she she uh, had a lot of fear. She was very she was a very adventuresome woman and very interesting that way. Reading through the book, it seemed to me that her trade craft as a spy 
sometimes left a lot to be desired. But then I think that's a problem you see with a lot of intelligence operatives around World War I and, and, and in the interwar year period. Is this due to lack of training or is it uh, just, as you said, you know, she's relying more on charm and her own personal skills as opposed to maybe relying on the official education of a spy? I, I think it's both. Foreign espionage was new to America in World War I. Uh, the very creation of the Military Intelligence Division was controversial. Many Americans thought it was fine just to rely on the Allies to gather intelligence and we didn't need our own agency. But Ralph and Demon and a few other Army officials, they really were uh, had the foresight to believe that we needed to collect our own military intelligence. Yet having said that, I don't know that there was a lot of training involved. From what I read, they... The members of the army who were assigned to military intelligence were trained in some uh, aspects, such as code breaking. Um, but I think it seemed like the civilians who were recruited to the uh, division were received little or no training. I saw no evidence that she had received any training at this time, although it is possible when she went over into France, there was some rudimentary training um, that they gave her before she entered in, into Berlin. There was a lag of several weeks that she could have had some training, but there's no, she reports nothing about it. Um, there are no letters or documents to indicate it. So I don't know that she received any training at all. She prided herself on her work, although sometimes, as I said, she seemed very naive and even unprofessional in the way she behaved. Sometimes her reports and writings differ from the reports and writings of her male colleagues. Do you think she was always a very reliable source? The men in the uh, military intelligence division, for the most part, seemed to believe so. They complimented her work and thought that she gave accurate reports. One thing that seems to differentiate her reports from what I was able to see of the other, uh, from the men, now I, again, I didn't do a comprehensive look of all the male reports, but from what I noticed, what I noticed were, was one thing in particular. She is much more, I would call it impartial in her report, in her reports. If there is something positive to say about Soviet Russia, she says it. Uh, so she doesn't write her reports as a polemic. Her German reports are um, mostly compilations of what she saw in terms of the her observations, uh, food food rations, factory inputs that she you know things that she had read in newspapers, and they are very dispassionate. Her her German reports. The only time um, I see opinion even really creeping in is when she was released from the Russian prisons twice. She does then give she is debriefed by the men in the military intelligence division. And at that point, she does give her subjective opinion about things. I think that the biggest difference we see is her public statements. When the men came out of Russia and came out of the Russian prisons in particular, they were very critical of Soviet Russia and related horror stories about the conditions in the Russian prisons. In her public statements to the press and in the speeches she gave after she was released, she does not talk about that. She says that, in fact, she says that she was treated no worse than, um, she, the food was no worse than you'd find in a hotel. And the conditions were no worse than in a Russian hotel. And I think most Americans were very, you know, just did not believe that she would say this. And that's why in the domestic uh, intelligence services, the FBI, uh, precursor for the FBI, they were questioning, you know, is she really a spy? You know, why is she saying these things when, we hear from the men that how the conditions are terrible. But the reports she gives to her superiors in the military intelligence division are much more accurate. And she does talk about the, um, the horror stories, the, the things that she had witnessed. And so a couple of things come to mind. Is she actually working here to try to infiltrate the uh, organizations that might be sympathetic to the communist um, efforts in Soviet Russian efforts here. Is that what she's doing? Is that why she presents a sympathetic view toward them in her public statements? Uh, or does she really have um, view somewhat sympathetically the Bolshevik government? Uh, there, you know, there are some questions about why she presented things the way she did. But I didn't get a feeling that any of the things she wrote was from a feminist perspective, that her voice was that of a woman compared to that her male colleagues. Um, she actually uh, I think in most ways was not feminist. She didn't care anything about women's suffrage. She apparently never voted in her entire life. Um, 
she didn't she re- usually did not give uh reports on women except at, later on in her asian trips she gave some reports about um the conditions for the women but i didn't sense that there was a feminist perspective or a female perspective in her reporting um so i do think that she definitely did make some serious mistakes. The most serious mistake she made was in Berlin, where she allowed another woman to uh, know that she was a spy. The woman's name was Stan Harding. And uh, later, when they, they coincidentally met again in Russia, um, Marguerite Harrison told the Bolsheviks that Stan Harding was a British spy. And that was a serious miscalculation on Marguerite Harrison's part, because probably not true. And second of all, Stan Harding was ruthless in demanding justice, not only from Marguerite Harrison, but from the U.S. government. And she sued Marguerite Harrison for libel. And she pursued this very publicly for many years, demanding that the United States pay retribution, uh, her restitution, sorry, pay restitution to her for what she had suffered after Marguerite Harrison had denounced her as a spy. Interesting, interesting behavior. I I found her time in Russia a little confusing, but again, just very interesting in terms of her voice and her reporting. Well, we don't want to give everything away, but after her missions to Russia, she is still not done. Tell us about her impressions of the situation in the Middle East. Her trip to the Middle East is one of the most intriguing um, adventures, I thought, of her life. She uh, never said she was spying. And the man she was with never said she was spying. So um, I found this almost accidentally. So she comes back. Uh, let me give a little bit of the history. So she's released from Russian prison the second time in February 1923. And the following summer, her friend Marion Cooper, who is uh, people will know as the director and producer and creator of King Kong, he uh, he was her friend, and he recruited her to join him on an expedition to the Middle East. And they were joined by his friend, Ernest Schotze. And the three of them said they were out to make a film about Persian nomads. And, and the movie that they did make was called Grass. But it's very clear from the, the, the archive, uh, archival records that this was also a spy mission. Uh, the tribe that they profiled happened to own the richest oil fields in present-day Iran. And at this time, Great Britain, Russia, and the United States were all in competition to try to get access to the Persian oil. Now, a lot of the evidence is circumstantial, but it seems very likely that Harrison and Cooper and Jensenk were there either at the behest of the U.S. government or of the U.S. oil interest. Uh, First off, I found a letter in the archive from Cooper written many years later to the military intelligence division saying that he wanted to undertake a spy mission on the eve of World War II. And he said that he had done something very similar twice before uh, in pretending to make a movie where he was actually on a spy mission. And at this time uh, that he was writing, he had only done He had only produced three foreign movies, and one of them was Grass. And it seems very clear that that Grass was one of the movies that he was speaking of when he admitted that he had undertaken these spy missions. And the second tiny piece of uh, the second clue in the archive are entries in the index for Marguerite Harrison's profile that show that show that she was undergoing training three times that spring from the military intelligence division and. This was after she had said she had stopped spying, and yet there was notations that she was undergoing training. The actual documents I could not find. There were only notations in the index saying that they were these papers were there. But the, I never found the actual papers. But it seemed that probably if she was going undergoing training, it was language training to prepare her to go into the Middle East, uh, teaching her perhaps um, Turkish or perhaps um, Farsi. So this uh, sent her off to uh, the Middle East, and there they they made their way around in Turkey and present-day Iraq and Iran, and following this tribe of nomads. And then they came back, and uh, she departed ways with uh, Cooper and Shotsang. They went on to make King Kong, and she just picked up her writing and lectures. Um, But I I think that this was one of her most interesting uh, trips. She... She, they never admitted to it. They always, in fact, men 
uh, showed Bank and Cooper always sort of disparaged Harrison, said that she had no business being on the trip, that she, um, you know, there was no place for a woman. And yet it seemed clear that Cooper had recruited her and probably because of her language abilities. She really seems to always be kind of at the tip of the spear, always turning up in regions where U.S. interests are involved or where U.S. interest is growing. Yes. I always think of her as like the Forrest stump of the intelligence service. She always <laughs> seems to know people and be involved in these situations that, that seem almost unrelated to each other or to anything else. And yet Marguerite Harrison seems to be the thread that connects them. Uh, her, the people she knew and encountered uh, it really span the gamut of uh, span mm-hmm. continents and time frames. Well, she seemed to meet or know everyone. Herbert Hoover, Leon Trotsky, Gertrude Bell, a young Robert Eichelberger, one of MacArthur's main commanders in World War II. What did her contemporaries think of her? The writings I found show that most people were very impressed with her, um, especially if uh, her first impression uh, noted her intelligence and her sophistication. Um, Again, I mentioned that her governess told her she should be charming, and most of the people found her to be that way. Um, Gertrude Bell, you know, writes to her father that, she, you know, describes the, um, Marguerite Harrison as a very intelligent woman. Um, Marion Cooper, as I mentioned, had been her friend who credited her with saving his life when he was in Russian prison. Um, yet she also could be very ruthless and unscrupulous. And it seemed like the people who knew her the best were the most critical of her. For example, her father-in-law, uh, he would write, uh, especially the second time she was caught in Russia and in, in prison. He wrote to his friends in the government, um, those who were in the, the State Department. He said, I don't know what she's up to. He says, if I ever find out what she's up to, I will let you know. Um, or he would write to friends and say, she says that she did not betray Stan Harding as a Bolshevik spy, as a British spy. I don't know whether to believe her or not. Um, her son you know, wrote a letter and said, I don't know why my mother keeps getting caught, you know, but if she ever decides, I hope that next time she'll decide she wants to get caught and be put in an American prisoner, an American prison. Granddaughter, who I interviewed, who lives in Owings Mills, Maryland, uh, she remembers her very well. And she talked about how she could be ruthless. Uh, She would, she took her son out of a high school that he liked very much when he was a senior and put him in a boarding school. And she left him there in Switzerland while she went to Russia. Uh, she basically abandoned the child really from the time he was 13, putting him into the care of servants um, until, um, you know, until he was a grown man. So the people who knew her the most, uh, the closest would say she was very ruthless, uh, very selfish. And um, yes, she had a layer of charm and sophistication, but deep down it was uh, a a woman who was a a very much strong-willed and determined to look for herself. You make this point several times throughout the book that she wasn't a female spy that used sex to get information. Why do you think this is so significant? Well, I think it's because she set the precedent. She was America's first female foreign intelligence agent hired by the military intelligence division. As I mentioned, we had had spies in this country doing domestic espionage, but she was the first to go overseas. And so whatever she did was going to set the precedent for for all the women who came here. And so, you know, I, while a lot of women, you know, were trading sex for secrets at this time, we we think, of course, most famously of Mata Hari. This was uh, not what Marguerite Harrison did. She was hired. First of all, you remember, she was almost 40 years old when she was hired. She had been married. She was the mother of a teenage son. And she was hired by Marlborough Churchill basically because she knew the languages of Europe and she knew their culture. And she could pretend to be a journalist, go in and gather information. And no one would suspect the difference because she would treat her espionage very much like she was writing a story. And so she would be able to go in and gather intelligence uh, without having to sleep with her sources. Um, and so the, this was significant because then, you know, when she was able to do this successfully, uh, then the women who came later in the OSS and in the CIA 
you know, men had already made up their minds that women could be successful at this. And so they don't have to be trading sex for secrets. We can use these women who have the intelligence of languages, the code breakers, women who have these other skills that uh, we can employ in espionage. We don't have to use them just to entice men into the bedroom. So that's why I think her legacy is so important, uh, because she was not like Mata Hari. And because she was the first, I thought that it was important to recognize that. And so what I think is her legacy uh, is simply that she proved that women could do this job without uh, having to sleep with her sources, you know, that she could use her brains and and other women could too. So she really seemed to normalize intelligence work for women. But Uh a lot of people don't really know much about her today, correct? That's correct. And that was why I thought it was interesting to uh, uh, to write about her. Um, You know, we just had uh, Gina Haspel was our former uh, intelligence, uh, head of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, Certainly there are many women spies now. And it started with this idea that I guess Marlboro Churchill saw that Margaret Harrison could go over and be helpful to her country. Um, the men who wrote her, uh, letters to her at this time, they praised her patriotism. They, um, you know, they, you know, she and she also reflected the idea that she was doing this for because she wanted to serve her country. And of course, Margaret Harrison also wanted to serve herself. You know, there was a streak of her that wanted adventure, that wanted to, you know, try new things, be in new places. She she loved the thrill of the danger. She loved the thrill of knowing something that someone else didn't know. Uh, But she did enter the work initially, I think, because she also wanted to serve her country. And that is something that I think many women could could relate to, uh, patriotism as well. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Atwood, for joining us. You're surely welcome. I've certainly enjoyed being here and and telling you a little bit about my book. I hope that uh, your uh, listeners will enjoy hearing about it. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.